Welcome to episode 68 of the Jewish History Podcast. I'm your host, Rabbi Yaakov Walby. I'm the Director of Outreach for Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston, torchweb.org. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. We're up to the third installment of our series on the Uncrippled War, and I want to apologize for the delay in releasing this episode these history podcast episodes on war especially are exceedingly difficult to prepare, and I fill the roles of researcher, writer, producer, editor of the Jewish History Podcast and my five other podcasts, the Parsha Podcast, Eternal Ethics, This Jewish Life, Torah 101, and the Mitzvah Podcast. So naturally, it takes a while, but it's here, and I pledge, please God, that the fourth and final installment on the Uncoupled War will be uploaded at a much shorter interval. Before we begin, I want to recommend two podcasts for you to check out. As I mentioned earlier, I personally host six different podcasts, and I know many of y'all listen to the Jewish History Podcast exclusively, but if you listen to more than one, and if you don't maybe consider sampling some of the others, I made a new podcast channel that contains no new content, but has all the podcasts from all the sit shows under one feed. It's called All Rabbi Yaakov Wolby Podcasts. Check it out. Also, my good friend Rabbi Ari Koretsky, he hosts a fantastic podcast called Jews You Should Know, where he interviews high-achieving and inspiring Jews from all fields. Rabbi Koretsky is an excellent and a sophisticated interviewer, and his podcast is a wonderful listen, and I highly recommend it. Check it out, Jews You Should Know. The Yom Kippur War is, at least from a military perspective, a tale of two conflicts. The early stages of the war were completely one-sided, with the combined Arab armies of Syria and Egypt dominating the battlefields and making huge gains and inflicting punishing blows to the Israelis. But the tide dramatically turned, and ultimately, though a substantial loss of life and materiel, the Israelis gained the upper hand and produced an incredible military victory albeit with very meager gains after the diplomatic and political dust settled. In the north, the Israelis made heroic and often Herculean efforts to slow the Syrians down and prevent an invasion of the heartland, but Syria still had captured enormous territory in the southern Golan and the vital outpost on the Hermon Mountain. In the south, Egypt had orchestrated a stunning crossing of the Suez Canal, and were entrenched all along the east bank of the canal with the Egyptian 2nd Army controlling the northern sector of the canal and the Egyptian 3rd Army controlling the southern sector. The early efforts of the Israelis to repel them and to push them back across the canal failed catastrophically, and by Tuesday, October 9th, the southern front was in a de facto state of stalemate. The Egyptians, they did skirmish a little bit eastward, they incrementally swelled their bridgeheads, but they were loath to leave the protection of their SAM missile umbrella and to stage a major attack, a major action, or to advance to the vital Mitla and Didi passes, the gateways to the rest of the Sinai that Egypt so lustfully coveted. As she repaired the tanks damage in the early days of the war, Israel was really weighing her options. None of them were particularly appealing. And in the Israeli military echelons, a spirited debate ensued regarding what to do now. If you try to pull back and try to lure the Egyptians outside of their protective umbrella, that seems like a recipe for protracted war and forfeiting the opportunity to potentially push the Egyptians past back on the west bank of the canal. Well, maybe you should attempt to cross the canal itself. And that, of course, demanded punching a hole through the Egyptian lines. And up to this point, it was not successful. And it would also be a complicated logistical operation, given that Israel would likely have to lay down her own bridges, capturing an Egyptian one was deemed infeasible, which would need to be navigated to the canal amid a heavy Egyptian presence. Well, what else is there? You try to attack the Egyptian bridgeheads again? Well, that failed multiple times. And given the remarkable performance of the protective wall of the SAM missiles, Israeli Air Force was unsuccessful at attacking the Egyptian bridgeheads, and the tank hunting units shooting Sagars and RPGs were decimating 
Israeli armor. It's interesting to note, as an aside, you know, throughout the whole war, the Israeli tanks completely outclassed the Arab tanks. And the same thing for Israeli pilots versus Arab pilots. But the Israeli Air Force and armor were hamstrung not by the opposing armor and Air Force, but by the anti-tank and anti-aircraft weaponry that Egypt so successfully wielded. So what's left to pursue a ceasefire? That's a terrible option at this point, given that Israel would be negotiating with a terrible hand and would have to forfeit, essentially, all of its six-day war gains. And it's also important to remember that at this point, there were still hundreds of men stranded in the forts along the Bar-Lev line, straddling the canal, completely surrounded by Egyptians, many of them fighting for their lives and considerations for those soldiers loomed large over every strategic decision. In short, there were really no great options on the table, but with the Sinai front relatively quiet, and with Israeli armor severely diminished, at the time there were just 400 tanks left in Sinai that were operational, the Israelis decided to make a very important, a very consequential pivot to focus on Syria, to try to disable them, maybe even knock them out of the war, and to consolidate forces to fight the Egyptians after the Syrian front was quieted. So they decided to suspend offensive operations in the south. They would limit the southern front to defensive actions alone while building up strength. Let's wear the Egyptians out, not us. Now, there were other reasons to focus on Syria first. Of course, Syria is closer to the Israeli heartland, and thus it was a much more critical conflict because there was much less room to fall back. Syria was also a much easier foe to defeat militarily than the Egyptians, and in addition, eliminating the Syrians would perhaps dissuade Iraq and Jordan from joining the conflict. And it's also important to stress that for some reason, the Syrians were a much more cruel and sadistic enemy compared to the Egyptians. You know, POWs suffered much more under the Syrians than under the Egyptians. For some reason, Syria harbored the most fanatical hatred of Israel in the Arab world. So the decision was made. Once the Syrians were neutralized, we will examine our options in the south. There was at least one general greatly disappointed with this decision, Ariel Sharon. One of the subplots on the southern front was this constant tension between Ariel Sharon and the rest of the military hierarchy in the south. He was always arguing for more attacking, and his superiors were always more circumspect. And this tension actually had a political tinge to it as well, given that Sharon had retired from the army three months before the war began, and he became a politician, and he was part of Menachem Begin's right-wing Likud party. He was called back to the southern front when the war broke out, and the bulk of the military and political establishment was from the left-wing labor party, the party that had ruled Israel since its founding. Every conflict between Sharon and his superiors had within it the suspicion that Sharon wanted his military glory to embellish his nascent political career while they wanted to suppress him politically and therefore they wanted to minimize the glory that he obtained in the battlefield. And Sharon vigorously opposed this this decision. He didn't want the Arabs to be allowed to build up. He was eager to cross the canal. He wanted to land in Africa. That was the favorite Israeli term for the West Bank of the Suez Canal. He wanted to land there since the war's outbreak. And he was always chomping at the bit to attack, attack, attack. And therefore, when the instruction came down, when the command, when the order came down to limit the South to defensive operations alone, he decided to take liberty with that order and to focus on what he called mobile defense. You know, we say a good offense is a great defense. He would constantly pluck away at the Egyptians in the South, even though they were really supposed to do defensive operations only. A battalion sent by Sharon to reconnoiter the Egyptian lines, discovered a critical flaw in the Egyptian defenses. The canal goes north to south, and in the middle of the canal, 
there's a large lake called the Great Bitter Lake. And the Egyptian second army was encamped north of the lake. And the Egyptian third army was south of the lake. And the lake itself had a 25 mile long coastline. But because the lake was too wide to bridge and could only be crossed by amphibious vehicles, the Egyptian had wisely opted to not deploy alongside the lake. But the Egyptian second army made a terrible blunder by resting its southern flank not on the northern banks of the Great Bitter Lake, but on the Tirtur Road, we'll talk about that road in a little bit, which lay a mile north of the lake. And that left a mile between the northern tip of the Great Bitter Lake and the southern flank of the Egyptian second army completely undefended. In Abraham Rabinovich's book, The Yom Kippur War, which incidentally I found to be by far the best of the six and a half books that I've been trying to navigate on this war, he compares this to someone's ankles being exposed by mosquitoes because the person pulled the blanket up too tight. And when the Israelis discovered that seam in the Egyptian defenses, the mosquitoes began to buzz. Very poetic. Crossing it at that time when they discovered it in the first week of the war was not possible. The Israeli bridging equipment was all the way in the rear. Like we said earlier, the prospects of capturing an Egyptian bridge were quite weak. But ultimately, this discovery was the key to reversing the course of the war, but turning that key would only happen after the Syrian quagmire was solved. Knocking the Syrians out of the war was imperative. That everyone agreed upon. And the defense minister, Moshe Dayan, he even suggested, and ultimately Chief of Staff David Lazar acceded to bombing Syrian civilian targets, not targeting civilians, but power stations, other infrastructure, in addition to its military targets. Such an attack, they postulated, would surely bounce the Syrians out of the war. Now, initially, Golda Meir, the prime minister, she hesitated to authorize such an attack. She feared that this would cause the Americans to withhold or to reconsider their rearmament. But there was justification because the Syrians had struck civilian targets of their own, And therefore, the government felt that they had enough cover to bomb the Syrian cities and target civilian targets. Of course, not civilians, but other infrastructure. And thus, they approved of it. And the first aerial attack on the Syrian heartland was commanded by Major Arnon Lapidot, along with seven other pilots flying jets. And their targets included the Syrian general staff headquarters in the center of Damascus and the nearby air defense headquarters. Now, the city was surrounded and protected by a maze of anti-aircraft batteries. And therefore, to avoid this anti-aircraft weaponry and to remain hidden from enemy radar, the decision was made to fly north over Lebanon and then to swing southward over the mountaintops to the north of Damascus. And this group of seven planes, seven jets, they managed to evade the anti-aircraft, which in itself is a whole long saga because there were clouds hovering on the mountaintops. They were flying so low to evade the radar, they almost crashed into the mountains. But they swooped over Damascus and released their ordinances before any Syrian defenses could be scrambled. And they quickly rushed and uh, landed in uh, back in back in Israel. The damage to the army headquarters was moderate. Some of the bombs hit a TV station. One jet suffered a malfunction. Its its bomb struck a Soviet cultural center in Damascus, actually killing 30, including several Soviet foreign diplomats. But the Syrians heard the message loudly and clearly. Your capital, Damascus, is well within our reach. If you strike our civilian targets, we will definitely retaliate. And indeed, throughout the rest of the war... Israeli civilian targets were not targeted by the Syrians. Now, Rabinovich tells an amazing anecdote at the time that the Israelis bombed the headquarters of the Syrian general staff in Damascus. In the basement of that same building, an Israeli pilot who had the misfortune of being shot down over Syria, his name was Avraham Barber, two days prior, he was shot down over Syria. He was interrogated in that same building at the time where the bomb struck. And he thought 
oh, the Israelis know where I am and they want to kill me before I reveal too much to the Syrians. So the truth was that the bombing had been the work of his very own squadron and the Israelis had no idea where this downed pilot was. Following the bombing in Damascus, the IAF, the Israeli Air Force, did 130 sorties on Syrian ports and refineries and power stations, roads, bridges, other infrastructure. And indeed, for months after the war, Syria would suffer quite frequent blackouts. But these aerial bombings on the Syrian home front did not have their intended consequence. While the bombings did compel the Syrians to withdraw some of their air force to protect the capital, they pulled them away from the battlefront. It did not succeed in forcing the Syrians out of the war. That would only happen on the battlefield, especially in the southern Golan, where the Syrians were occupying vast swaths of Israeli territory. Now, in the early days of the war, specifically on the northern front, those times, those moments were characterized by inadequacy. There was not enough men. There was insufficient tanks. You had platoons fighting tanks with Uzis and bazookas. The Israelis on the front had no artillery support, no air support. There's multiple episodes of troops raiding Syrian tanks for weapons, Kalashnikovs, RPGs, etc. But after the first few days of mayhem on the Syrian front, order was being restored. Israeli reserve units who were thrown together the first couple of days in a desperate attempt to plug the holes in the lines, they joined the regular crews, casualties are replaced, and each night, maintenance crews would rehabilitate the damaged tanks for the following day. For example, Musa Pellet's division went to sleep on Tuesday, October 9th, with 70 operational tanks. They woke up the next day with 200 functioning tanks as a result of the valiant efforts of the engineers and the repair crews working tirelessly to fix the damaged armor. And as the Israelis advanced and fought back to their original lines, more and more of their previously discarded tanks and other vehicles were accessible to be repaired and be brought back to the battlefield. Though they were still outnumbered, they were still outgunned, the counterattack began. As the tanks began creeping towards the Syrian lines, a rolling artillery barrage preceded them. And incidentally, it's important to note, the Golan and the Sinai have very different terrain. The Golan is, is, uh, is very rocky. The Sinai, of course, is a, is a desert full of sand. And artillery is much more effective in the rocky Golan. The shells would shatter and lethally ricochet all over. Whereas in the Sinai, it would just be absorbed by the sand and it was much less damaging to the enemies. And along these main axes, the Syrians had established a dense concentration of anti-tank guns and the Israelis began grinding their way through. This was a very perilous, very dangerous enterprise because the Syrians, they weren't just in front of them. It wasn't a uh, even battlefront. They had penetrated between the Israeli positions and therefore they were attacking from every direction. And the fighting is very fierce, very close range, often point blank, and it's nonstop to the point of total physical exhaustion and emotional numbness. This was a battle of tenacity, a battle of determination, a confrontation of endurance. Who could outlast the enemy? But the truth was that the heart had gone out of the Syrian attack. They had missed their moment a couple of days prior. They were demoralized. And like 67, the Syrian units began disobeying orders, retreating without permission, abandoning fully functioning tanks. And after four days of ferocious fighting, the valley is riddled with smoldering Syrian tanks. The Syrian high command made the fateful decision to withdraw back to the purple line back to the original borders at the beginning of the Yom Kippur War. Ironically, the Israeli collapse of the first couple of days of the war had inadvertently contributed to the routing of the Syrian army because the Syrians had made so much headway. They advanced so much of their armor into Israeli territory in the beginning of the war. When they retreated, there was a lot of their armor that was subject to Israeli ambushes. 
And indeed, when they retreated, they left more than 600 tanks behind. By Wednesday afternoon, phase one of the northern counterattack was completed. With the exception of the Hermon outpost, all Israeli territory in the north had been reconquered. And of course, at that time, it's a very important strategic dilemma that was facing David Lazar and the rest of the military and political leadership. What do you do now? Do you deploy along the Purple Line, the original border between you and Syria? Do you pursue the retreating Syrians, try to conquer new territory? And of course, both sides had their merits. Those in favor of staying put argued that the Syrians had reinforced their defenses along the line. They had bolstered their ranks with men who had retreated from the Golan. Invading Syria past the Purple Line would be no cakewalk. The Israelis were also in a state of complete exhaustion. This was not the condition of an army invading Syria. Moreover, halting the advance on the line would allow the additional benefit of maybe sending up to 250 tanks off to the Sinai where they were so desperately needed. And finally, the Purple Line, that was the site of the previous ceasefire line, and the Israelis already had somewhat sustainable defensive lines If you invade Syria, you may conquer new territory, but that will require you to create and install and defend a brand new defensive line. And therefore, many argue that it makes sense to deploy along the line and focus on the Sinai. On the other hand, invading Syria offered tantalizing opportunities. It held the potential of knocking the Syrians out of the war. And also, if you conquer new territory, that could be used as a valuable bargaining chip for a ceasefire or potential prisoner of war negotiations. It would also boost Israeli morale, knowing that the entire Syrian front had netted something favorable. It would also hopefully reinstate the somewhat crippled Israeli deterrent. And of course, there's all kinds of other considerations How are the Russians going to react if Damascus becomes threatened? Would an invasion increase or decrease the likelihood of Iraq and Jordan joining the war? Balancing all these considerations, Golda Meir made a decision to indeed launch an invasion into Syria to commence the following day, give the troops some time to rest. On Thursday, October 11th, five days after Yom Kippur, the first day of the festival of Sukkot, to actually invade Syria. As an aside, it's important to remember that the festival of Sukkot, the Jewish people, we build temporary homes, Sukkot, to remember our ancestors persevering in temporary huts and temporary dwelling places in Sukkot in the desert after the exodus from Egypt. It's one of those surreal moments in history. You have Jews from the Jewish state building Sukkot out of ammunition boxes while fighting for their lives in the Sinai Desert, the very same desert that their ancestors built Sukkot more than 3,000 years prior. Meanwhile, in Washington, the Americans were conducting high-level deliberations of their own regarding Israel's desperate requests for armaments. Does Israel even need more arms? The CIA chief, William Colby, said that Israel has enough ammunition for at least two more weeks. Secretary of State James Schlesinger, a Jew who had converted to Christianity as a young man, he argued that they shouldn't send arms to Israel to maintain their, quote, occupied Arab territories. Evidently, he was a traitor to his people in more than one way. Another great Jewish friend, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, was always trying to kind of straddle both sides. We can't allow the Soviet arms to triumph over American ones. But we don't want to give the Israelis too much support. And the friend of the Jews in the time of need was, surprisingly, President Nixon. Although mired in the height of the Watergate scandal, and American foreign policy was principally administered by Henry Kissinger, in this matter, he was decisive. He told Golda Meir, all aircraft, all tank losses would be replenished. In fact, every item on the Israelis' wish list With the exception of laser-guided missiles, they would all be granted. But this was only one of the hurdles needed to rearm Israel. Kissinger told the Israelis, you can have all the weapons. 
but you need to transport them yourselves. Bring your El Al cargo planes, provided that their logos and other identifying markers are covered, and take whatever you want from American air bases. He was obsessed with the idea of instituting America as the one that the Arab world turns to as opposed to the Soviets. And therefore, he didn't want to favor the Israelis too much. And even when he did favor the Israelis, it should be done secretly. You could have the weapons, but we're not going to give you the planes. And even the Israeli planes, all the Israeli signage has to be removed when you're coming to American air bases to load up on weapons. The problem is, of course, that Israel had only seven such aircraft, and they're not exactly configured to transport this kind of weaponry. And foreign airlines and foreign charter companies, they turned down these flights. They didn't want to fly in a, in a war zone. They feared an Arab boycott. Ultimately, Nixon decided that American military transports will be used to fly these provisions to their ally in need. Of course, the European nations, they refused to allow the planes to fly over or to stop and refuel. Kissinger had to threaten the Portuguese to allow the planes to refuel. He told them, if you don't accept this, you guys are on your own. We're never going to help you again. Flying over the Mediterranean from Portugal demanded American aircraft carrier support, and the transport planes were escorted by American fighter jets until 150 miles off Israel's coast. They were handed over to Israeli jets to be brought to Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. All told, in what was known as Operation Nickel Grass, the Americans provided Israel with 22,000 tons of supplies, 40 transport planes landing in a day, compared to the Soviets' 15,000 tons of supplies to Syria and Egypt. The American airlift had far-reaching consequences, some of them intended, some of them not intended. Militarily, its impact was indirect. Only a small part of these weapons were actually used in the war itself, but it did allow the Israelis to expand their stockpiles more freely. The American airlift also led to an imposition of the Arab oil weapon when Arab members of OPEC organized an oil embargo upon nations supporting Israel, leading to severe shortages and rationing of oil and gas all over the United States with friends like the Saudis who needs enemies. The American airlift also ironically provided political cover for a ceasefire to eventually be reached because Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, was able to save face by saying, I'm not losing to the Israelis, I'm losing to the Americans. But it's important to remember that the Americans, and particularly President Richard Nixon, they came to Israel's aid in her time of need. The invasion of Syria was set for Thursday at 11 a.m., so the sun doesn't blind the Israelis' eyes. Unlike the Syrians who attacked along the whole line, the Israeli attack would be concentrated in poking a hole in one area north of Kenitra with the Hermon Mountain hugging their left flank as they headed towards Damascus. The attack would be manned by three forces attacking eastwards, along three parallel axes. The Syrian army had mined the entire area, but because it was an agricultural location, it was home to many Syrian farms, and therefore there were mindless paths between the fields for the farmers, and the Israelis conveniently used those paths. Despite a few initially unsuccessful attempts to secure various Syrian strongholds, by Friday, they were one fortified position away from the Damascus region, a mere 20 miles from the Syrian capital. As they were about to barrel to the northeast, they discovered a large tank force coming from the southeast, nowhere near where they had anticipated a Syrian concentration of tanks. And this columns of tanks were heading in their direction. So initially they thought that perhaps these were an Israeli force, but soon enough it became clear that these were Arab tanks, not Syrian, but Iraqi. The Iraqi expeditionary force was joining the war. Despite the fact that there was no love lost between Iraq and Syria, Iraq had volunteered to send their expeditionary force in the event of a conflict. 
the mortal enemies, the Iranians, agreed to allow passage, as did the Kurds. This is eerily similar to the episode in the Book of Numbers, where two erstwhile enemies, the nations of Moab and Midian, joined forces to attack the Jews with anti-Semitism. As much as things change, they seem to stay the same. These Iraqis were really totally unprepared for this war. They didn't know the terrain well. They were woefully inexperienced, and they were eviscerated. The Israelis ambushed the force. They destroyed 50 tanks with not even a single Israeli tank lost. And this battle was lopsided, but nevertheless, the arrival of the Iraqis halted the Israeli advance towards Damascus. By war's end, the Iraqi expeditionary force would number 500 tanks, 700 APCs armored personnel carriers, and 30,000 men, which matched Israeli strength in the Golan. And although they were vastly inferior soldiers, their presence would color all decisions on the northern front. With the Syrians driven past the Purple Line, the time had come for Israel to concentrate on the Egyptians in the Sinai. There were several concerns looming above the discussions. Number one, there was the expectation that the UN, the Americans and the Russians, would impose a ceasefire agreement forcing an armistice upon the Israelis in a very disadvantageous position. This meant that the attack had to come promptly. The only viable option to salvage something from this war was to attempt a canal crossing. But on top of the two armies guarding the bridgeheads on the Israeli, the eastern side of the canal, the Egyptians had formidable forces on the western side of the canal too, which meant that even after you cross, it's not going to be easy. You can't just march to, to Cairo. You're going to have to face enemies there too. And the generals were split as to what effect this would have. A crossing would definitely give the Israelis the opportunity to disrupt supply lines. It would give them access to many of the SAM missile sites that were so destructive to Israeli aircraft. It would also surprise the Egyptians, and it would strike terror into their hearts, leaving them worried about their heartland about Cairo. In addition, crossing would play to the strengths of the Israelis. It would let them use speed and maneuverability in open warfare. And some argued that a crossing would usher a swift Egyptian collapse. At this time, Chief of Staff David Lazar was much more pessimistic. He didn't believe anymore that Israel had the power to bring Egypt to her knees. And instead, he thought they should aim for a ceasefire. And he thought the only way to get the ceasefire was to do a crossing. Ironically, Moshe Dayan thought that doing a crossing would make it less likely that the Arabs would accept a ceasefire, but really no one had a better solution as to how to proceed in the south. Dayan didn't want to make the decision. El Azar didn't want to make the decision. He thought it was a political decision, not a military decision. And they agreed to meet in the cabinet together with Prime Minister Golda Meir on Friday afternoon. At this meeting, they got fantastic news. The Mossad confirmed that Egypt would attack the Mitla and Didi passes either the following day on Saturday on Shabbos or on Sunday. For the past couple of days, neither side had launched any significant actions. Each side was entrenched. There was a standoff. Each side was waiting for the, waiting for the other one to make a move. By attacking, Egypt would be leaving the cover of its missile umbrella and would be exposing its armor to decimation. Why would they do that? It turns out it wasn't for military calculations. It was for political reasons. The Syrian president Assad... He sent an emissary to Sadat, pleading with him to keep the pressure on the Israelis to relieve some of the pressure that he felt in the north. Sadat also believed that capturing these two vital strategic passes located deeper in the Sinai would make his position stronger during post-war negotiations, and therefore, disregarding the protests of his military establishment, he ordered the Egyptians to go back on the offensive and to go try to capture the Mitla and Gidi passes. This was a terrible strategic blunder. The initial Arab crossing was so successful specifically because of the Sam, the surface-to-air missiles, uh, 
And if they were to penetrate into the Sinai, they would no longer have that protection and those conditions would heavily favor the Israelis. At this meeting in the Prime Minister's office, it was agreed to signal to the Americans we had, we're willing to accept a ceasefire, of course now knowing that Egypt wouldn't accept it, on her own part, planning this big operation. And that would, of course, ensure that there would be no hiccups in the American rearmament. And they also agreed to postpone the decision regarding their own canal crossing after the clash in the Sinai, something that they believe will be the turning point of the war. Ironically, an hour later in Cairo, another meeting occurred and the identical assessment was reached by the Egyptian military commanders, but the politicians insisted on advancing to the passes and that is what they would do. The tank battles that ensued on Sunday, October 14th, were the largest tank battles in the world since World War II, since 1943 in Kursk. Israel had 700 tanks in the Sinai. They were on the high ground, lying in wait for the Egyptians, who they knew were coming. The second and third armies were ordered to attack eastward in six simultaneous thrusts over a broad front, over 800 tanks, but lacking the crucial sand cover, and with only the Egyptian air force protecting Egyptian armor, they left behind five infantry divisions to hold the bridgeheads. Prior to the tank attack, Egyptian helicopters set down 100 commandos to disrupt the Israeli rear, but they were quickly subdued. The Israelis killed 60 and they took numerous prisoners that actually stopped future commando raids that were planned. Concurrently, the Israeli commando raid behind enemy lines was successful and they managed to destroy a communication site that disrupted Egyptian command and control and exacerbated its defeat. At 6 a.m. on Sunday morning, the Egyptians began the attack with a blistering 15-minute artillery barrage followed by head-on attacks against the waiting Israeli defenses. The attack was a total failure. It was the first major Egyptian loss of the war. They lost hundreds of tanks while fewer than 40 Israeli tanks were hit and all but six of them were quickly repaired and returned to service. And by early afternoon on Sunday, the Egyptians withdrew. In keeping up with the tradition of the Six-Day War, the Egyptian propaganda machine refused to tell the truth and the radio broadcast in Cairo triumphantly declared the Mitla Pass is in our hands. Sharon wanted, of course, to pursue the fleeing Egyptians. They told him, no, we have to do this in a more orderly fashion. That Sunday night, David Lazar got the approval from the cabinet to do the canal crossing. The plan was for laying two bridges across the canal, just north of the Great Bitter Lake, and that seam that we talked about earlier, that seam between the second army and the lake in the northern sector of the canal. And there were other advantages to use that spot to cross. Not only was there a seam there, the other side from whatever the Israelis could look at, it was curiously free of Egyptian forces. So there were seam on both sides, just a critical fatal blunder of oversight on the Egyptians' part. Also, during his stint as the commander of the Southern Front, Ariel Sharon had prepared that particular spot, it became known as the Yard. He prepared it for a future crossing by reinforcing it with earthen ramparts that would provide some measure of protection for the troops as they were waiting to cross. It wasn't enough to just arrive at the waterfront, at the waterline, for the crossing to be fully commenced. This was a logistical nightmare, because the Egyptians, they had heavily mined and armed and defended position in a place known as the Chinese farm that was less than a thousand yards from the crossing point. So if you want to get personnel and materiel to cross, you'd have to first open up a corridor and secure it by pushing the Egyptians in the Chinese farm less than a thousand yards away. You'd have to push them north. That task was given to Ariel Sharon's division. Knowing, of course, that he was itching to cross, Chaim Barlev told him, he says, before you go to the Cairo Hilton, you need to be released of your current responsibility of widening the corridor to allow the Israelis to arrive at the 
waterline. Before you head over to Africa, make sure you fulfill your responsibilities in Asia. And the plan was, once you clear the corridor, you'll have two divisions crossing the canal. One division, commanded by Avram Adan, Bren, his nickname was, would head south to, towards Suez City. And the other division, headed by Sharon, would head north to Ismailia, and all along the way, clearing Sam batteries to enable the Israeli Air Force to operate. Once firmly established in Africa, the plan was to at least have the possibility to head west to Cairo or perhaps encircle one or maybe even both of the Egyptian armies that were entrenched on the east bank of the canal. The plans were quite ambitious, but a lot of technical and logistical work needed to be done beforehand. The most important matter were the bridges. Ever since the Six-Day War, the IDF had been thinking about contingency plans that would require it to cross the canal. Consequently, Western countries refused to sell bridging equipment to the Israelis. The best they could do was a British system of floating iron cubes that could be linked together to form a pontoon bridge that the Israeli engineers who were scouring Europe, they had discovered these pontoon pieces that linked together to form the bridge would be strong enough to hold tanks. That was one option, the, the pontoon bridge that they had. In classic Israeli fashion, they also invented their own bridge. This became known as the roller bridge. It was one piece, it was assembled into one piece, uh, 400 tons, and it was 200 yards long. And this would be thrust across the canal. The canal was only 180 yards wide after it was rolled to the waterline. Now, towing a 400-ton, 200-yard long bridge across a desert is as logistically nightmarish as it sounds. It can only be towed in a straight line over flat terrain. And therefore, the IDF had built a long, straight dirt road called their Tertu Road, that would be a direct five-mile route from the assembly location of the bridge straight to the canal to the anticipated location of the crossing. The problem, of course, was that this road had fallen under Egyptian control, and therefore you'd have to find an alternative route where you're taking your 400-ton, 200-yard bridge, it's going to take it on a route that's three times as long over hilly desert terrain and dunes. And to make matters more complicated, the company specifically trained to transport the bridge was currently fighting in the Golan, and a different battalion would have to step up and maneuver the roller bridge. How exactly do you move a 200-yard long bridge over desert terrain? They hooked up, initially it was 12 tanks, including one in the rear that acted as a brake, and they began inching towards the canal at night. It would be too easy and too big of a target to be transported by day, the Egyptians would love nothing more than to bomb this bridge, and therefore they'd do it only at night, and at first light they would camouflage it with netting, and they'd have anti-taint units stationed all around it, and the Air Force would maintain a presence overhead for the duration of the days between its night-long journeys. On one of its very first descents, the bridge overran its tanks, it didn't cause too much damage, but that would be the first of many mishaps, many stumbles during the long saga of transporting this roller bridge, lumbering in the desert like a massive caterpillar to the canal. Besides for the pontoon bridge and the roller bridge, there was a third option to get tanks across the canal. It was essentially scrap metal rafts that the IDF had rehabilitated into being able to carry tanks. That was the third option. With the bridges rolling quite slowly to the canal, the battles to secure a corridor to the canal and to cross the canal, this whole operation was known as Operation Stout-Hearted Men, it began on the evening of Monday night. At 5 p.m., an artillery barrage opened all along the Egyptian line so as to not reveal the point of attack. A diversionary attack commanded by Tuvia Raviv was mounted at dusk on Missouri Ridge, it was an Egyptian position north of the Chinese farm. A second brigade, commanded by Colonel Amnon Reshef, their task was to crush the entrenched Egyptians in the Chinese farm before dawn to allow for a dawn crossing. 
uh, planning on infiltrating the Chinese farm from the south. They thought that part was undefended and they were going to penetrate as deeply as possible in the middle of the night in the Chinese farm, quietly, without any lights, without any radio communication, and then hopefully exploding like a grenade and getting the entrenched Egyptians to scatter. It turned out that the southern entrance to the farm that they thought was undefended was actually defended, and half the battalion was destroyed by the Egyptians before they could even enter the farm. But the rest of them penetrated the farm, and this began the, the battle of, of the Chinese farm, and the descriptions are, are mayhem. I want to read the description from Abraham Rabinovich's The Yom Kippur War. Half the brigade had been stopped, but the truncated head of the column plunging into the enemy rear was sowing havoc. Mitzna's battalion found itself in the midst of a divisional logistical center. Ammunition dumps, jeeps, tanks, trucks, personnel carriers, fuel tankers, artillery batteries, SAM batteries. The tanks fired in every direction. SAM missiles hit by shells took off in wild gyrations and ammunition dumps exploded. Hundreds of Egyptian soldiers could be seen running in the reddish-yellow light of burning vehicles and the flare of explosions. Some came out of foxholes wrapped in blankets against the cold desert night. The Israeli team commanders hurled grenades and used their Uzis against close-in targets. But it was the machine guns and the tank guns that carried the fight. The commanders took to crushing ammunition crates under the tank treads instead of shooting at them in order to avoid the explosions and glare that would expose them to RPG teams. This was a crazy battle. It was fierce, fighting at night in close proximity nearly impossible to distinguish between friend and foe. The Israelis were taking heavy losses, but they were inflicting brutal blows to the enemy, but the whole scene was pandemonium. They're spraying Egyptian trenches with machine gun fire, exploding radar stations, igniting ammunition dumps, shooting the enemy headquarters. There's one wild story that he tells. An Israeli tank destroyed an Egyptian tank, and as it's scanning the area for another tank, an Egyptian soldier who doesn't realize exactly what's going on, calmly climbs onto the tank. He assumes it was an Egyptian tank, and he asks the soldiers in the hatch for a cigarette. The commander, who understood Arabic, he tossed him instead a live grenade and eliminated him. Another great quote here from Rabinovich. They had penetrated a hornet's nest, and the hornets were swarming, angry, but disoriented. At dawn, the intersection was finally captured when the Egyptians raised the white flag of surrender, but the costs were high. The Israelis had lost 128 men dead, 62 wounded, and had lost 56 tanks. And the Chinese farm was still in enemy hands, and the fighting there would continue for several days. But at least the path to the canal was temporarily available. It would close again soon. And for the first time in Israeli history, its soldiers and its tanks were about to step into Africa. The crossing would not be done under ideal conditions. The roads that led to the canal and to the crossing site were soon back in enemy hands. And these locations, these roads and these intersections were the site of bloody and bitter battles for several days. Moreover, the rolling bridge, now it has 16 tanks and two boulders trying to maneuver it, it was experiencing all kinds of trouble simply just getting to the canal. It had climbed a steep slope and then it snapped, resulting in damage that they estimated would take 24 hours to repair. The pontoon boat was also caught amid a huge traffic snarl as it tried to get its way to the canal. The initial crossing would be done by a team of commandos in rubber boats and ferrying those tanks over in rafts. Sharon was so excited, so beside himself that we're finally going into Africa. He made sure all the soldiers who were crossing were were shaved, they were presentable. He called his wife excitedly. This was the moment that he had been waiting for. A bulldozer broke through the ramparts on the canal. The barbed wire on the canal's embankments were cleared by engineers and they began the artillery bombardment on the other side and at 1.35 a.m., six boats laden with equipment set off swiftly to the other side. Once across, they put a stick of dynamite and blew a hole 
on the five-foot wall on the other side of the canal. They were armed with all kinds of anti-tank weaponry and were prepared to inflict the same kind of damage to Egyptian armor that the Egyptians had done so successfully to the Israeli armor over the past couple of days. But as they peered through the hole, they encountered no Egyptians. Swiftly, the boats ferried over 750 commandos and they staked out a perimeter three miles wide and a mile deep, a bridgehead, a small one, a modest one, but a bridgehead in Africa. They dug foxholes in anticipation of the enemy arrivals. The next phase of the war was beginning. The commandos were soon joined by tanks ferried on the motorized rafts and additional infantry, and they began to run roughshod over Egyptian installments. They left seven tanks to guard the bridgehead and began waltzing in Africa, destroying dozens of tanks and other Egyptian vehicles laden with forces and weapons, and began heading to the Sam missile sites and destroying them one after another. At one Egyptian logistics center a mile from the crossing point, the Egyptian guard sees these approaching tanks, and of course he assumes they're Egyptian. He salutes them as they roll in, and they proceed to destroy numerous vehicles and anti-aircraft guns. They made a 60-mile circuit, creating a window free of anti-aircraft coverage. Israeli aircraft now had a portal through which to penetrate Egyptian airspace. It took a long time for the Egyptians to figure out exactly what was going on. They initially, they thought it was just a minor raid, nothing too intense. Maybe two, three tanks. Just send over some units to plug the gap and repel the invaders. In fact, it took them 30 hours to pinpoint the location of the crossing. But the truth is that the crossing was, at this point, still quite limited, given that they had really no clear roads leading to the canal, no reliable bridge to transport material and personnel over, the rafts were doing great, but that would not be enough to transport the masses needed to change the war. And sure enough, the fight broke out between Barlev and Sharon again. Sharon wanted to seize the moment, to cross as many tanks as possible, to take the initiative, to wreak irreparable damage while the opportunity availed itself. Before the Egyptians grasp what's going on, Barlev is more cautious. We need an Eclair Road. We need a sturdy bridge. We need to broaden the corridor on the East Bank. What's going to be, if that gets closed off, our forces on the West Bank might be cut off. If we don't have a bridge, maybe we need to withdraw, we have to pull back our troops. And incidentally, Golda Mayer made a serious blunder, but it turned out to be a good thing. She announced on the Knesset floor, in an effort to boost Israeli morale, that the IDF was operating on the West Bank of the Suez. The Egyptians didn't really know that that was happening, and when they heard it, they didn't believe her. But the truth is, is that once she said that, it ensured that a withdrawal would not happen. The Israelis, they were all in. But to really complete the crossing, to really change the course of the war for good, the corridor on the East Bank must be broadened and the bridges must finally be installed. After a raging, bloody, nightlong battle on the roads and the intersections leading to the canal and on the Chinese farm, The area was littered with smoldering wrecks of tanks and hundreds of destroyed vehicles, scores of dead on both sides. The scene was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Moshe Dayan later would say, quote, I am no novice to war or battle scenes, but I have never seen such a sight. Not in reality, not in photographs, not even in the worst war movies. Here was a vast field of slaughter stretching as far as the eye could see. Ariel Sharon himself said, quite poetically, it was as if a hand-to-hand battle of armor had taken place. Coming close, you could see the Egyptian and Israeli dead lying side by side. Soldiers who had jumped from the burning tanks and died together. No picture could capture the horror of the scene. None could encompass what had happened there. The devastation was considerable, But finally, the roads opened enough, the corridor widened enough for the pontoon bridge to pass and finally arrive at the canal. The roller bridge, it had broken instead of 24 hours to repair it, and an Israeli engineer came up with a different solution. Instead of repairing the broken part, they would simply cut it off and weld the two parts back together. Instead of taking 24 hours to fix, it would take only three hours to fix. Yes, it would shorten the bridge by five meters, but 
but it would still be long enough to traverse the canal. By the time the pontoon bridge arrived at the canal, the Egyptians had finally pinpointed the location of the crossing, and they were subjecting them to a ferocious artillery barrage. Installing this bridge would be done under intense artillery fire. When the barrage began, everyone who was at the yard, everyone was at the crossing site who was not in a foxhole or in an armored vehicle was hit. And when they went about installing the bridges, clearing away both sides, etc., they gave each task to two men. In the event that one of them was hit by the intense shelling, the other would step in into his place. The bridges were appeared, they put sand, they put wooden planks. Sherwood himself was gashed in his forehead, and for the rest of the war, his head was iconically wrapped in a bandage. At one point, a bunch of Egyptian tanks approached, and at that particular moment, there were no Israeli tanks to counter them. They could have destroyed the pontoons, the rafts, the boats, and everything else. Sharon radioed his tanks to approach, and in the meantime, he ordered his APCs, his armored personnel carriers, to shoot at the tanks with their machine guns. But of course, those machine guns are harmless to the tanks. So what's the point? Shoot at them nonetheless, he said. It's going to distract them long enough until our tanks arrive. And sure enough, the Israeli tanks arrived and destroyed the intruders. With the pontoon bridge installed, the roller bridge would take another day for it to arrive, the Israeli tanks began rolling across into Africa in Moss, still under constant barrages of enemy artillery. At one point, a tank driver was hurrying to get across and he began to tailgate the tank in front of him and he caused that one of the pontoon sections separated and broke, and they had to replace it with a bridging tank that was put over that broken section. All the while, you have those trusty rafts that are still ferrying tanks across, two at a time, despite being incessantly battered by artillery and all the rafts being punctured by shrapnel. The crews were instructed to keep the hatches of the tanks open to enable an escape in case they capsized. Sadly, there were two tanks that had kept their hatches closed because of all the shelling. When the raft was hit mid-canal, it immediately capsized and all the crew perished inside their tanks at the bottom of the canal, 40 feet below. By Friday, October 19th at 6 a.m. in the morning, the roller bridge concluded its odyssey across the desert. It was installed a mile north of the pontoon bridges, and the Israelis were in business. The war was not yet over. There was much more yet to be done. But with the Egyptians on the east bank of the canal, the Egyptian second army in the north, the Egyptian third army in the south, entrenched, Africa had invaded Asia. Now that the Israelis were in Africa, the tide had dramatically turned. In the next episode of the Jewish History Podcast, which again will hopefully not take as long to post as this one. We're going to tell the story of the end of the war and its aftermath. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for downloading. If you have not yet done so, please give the Jewish History Podcast a five-star review on iTunes. Also, please consider making a donation to our organization to Torch to support the fantastic work of Torch and connecting Jews and Judaism and the many podcasts and the host of other programs Our organization subsists solely on the generosity of our friends and our supporters. Please consider submitting a donation on our website. The website is torchweb.org. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I hope to hear from you soon.